and we're live now. Welcome everyone. Chris, are you sharing the slides? Okay. All right, welcome everybody to the welcome event and our initial keynotes for USAR 2020. My name is Chris Prenner. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at St. Louis University and one of the three co-chairs uh, along with Heidi and Janine who will be introducing themselves in just a second. Before we go further, I wanna do two things. First, I wanna acknowledge our sponsors whose logos are on the corner there, uh, particularly our studio, which is the premier sponsor for Use R2020. So thank you to all those organizations uh, for supporting our virtual event this year. The other thing I want to do is remind folks about the hashtag we're using. So if you are on Twitter, uh, the hashtag is use R2020. Uh, please feel free to tag uh, us in that uh, as you send out tweets about our events. I also want to take a moment to thank uh, two groups. First, I want to thank both the Munich and St. Louis organizing teams who spent um, much of the last year planning for an in-person conference. Um, it's bittersweet to be doing this over Zoom. Um, while we're really thrilled we're able to share this content with the R community, I think we're also a bit sad that we were not able to do these conferences in person. Um, and certainly for speaking um, from the St. Louis team, uh, we had a very large team. There were over 60 of us uh, who spent about 18 months preparing for that in-person conference. And so I just wanna thank all of you for your contributions, both to the conference and the art community uh, and thank the Munich team as well for their uh, contributions to the conference. I also wanna thank uh, three universities that have uh, lent institutional support to USAR this year. It's not possible for us to put on USAR without that type of support. And so I wanna thank uh, my institution, St. Louis University, uh, Janine's institution, Washington University in St. Louis, and Heidi's institution, the University of Munich, uh, for their support of USAR 2020. With that out of the way, uh, I wanna let folks know about our live events. So after our welcome event here, we'll have two keynotes uh, from Martin Machler and Luke Tierney, who will be talking about new developments in R. Uh, there'll be a quick break after those events. And then we have a panel of R core members who will be available to talk both about where R is headed and uh, about the work that R core does. Um, Slido is already open. If you have questions for Martin, for Luke, or for the R Core panel, uh, please post those questions to Slido. Uh, and also, it would be really helpful for us if you could identify whether your question is for Martin, for Luke, or for the panel. Uh, tomorrow, we've got two keynotes. Uh, first up is Noam Ross in the morning, uh, talking about his work at R OpenSci, and then Amelia McNamara talking about um, talking uh, about a talk called Speaking R. On the 10th, uh, Anna Cristalli uh, has a talk called Computational Reproducibility from Theory to Practice. And Aaron Liddell has a talk about uh, responsible automation uh, towards an interpretable and fair auto machine learning. And then finally, um, on July 11th, uh, Chemik Bysak uh, has another talk about machine learning. Uh, all the times you see there on the right are in the UTC time zone. Uh, you can see them all listed on our website as well. Speaking of our website, I want to highlight one particular, particularly important piece of content, and that is our code of conduct. Even though we're not meeting in person this year, the code of conduct is still a really uh, crucial part of the use our experience. Um, the URL for the code of conduct is there at the bottom along with an email, use r 2020-dei at slu.edu. Um, what we expect from participants in Slido uh, when using the use r 2020 hashtag on social media um, and any, on any other digital platform where you might be discussing USAR is that folks follow our expected behavior. And that includes uh, being considerate um, both in language and actions, uh, respecting fellow participants' boundaries, uh, refraining from any demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and language. 
Um, and if you see folks uh, on social media um, that seem to be violating our code of conduct, please let us know at that USAR 2020 DEI email. We'll be checking it regularly over the next few days. Um, and while, of course, we, we expect everyone to stick by this, uh, we will be watching that email in case folks have any concerns. So thank you very much for both checking out the code of conduct and adhering to it during USAR 2020. Turn things over to Heidi now to talk about our YouTube content. Yeah, so thank you, Chris, uh, and welcome from Munich. Um, my name is Heidi Seibold, and I'm the I was supposed to be the chair um, for the Munich satellite event, but since we've joined forces with St. Louis, we're not now um, organizing this whole virtual event together. We are excited um, to be able to make all our content available free of charge. All keynotes are live streamed on YouTube and will also be made available after. All keynotes are live captioned. You can also turn on your captions now. You can also, as Chris mentioned, ask any questions on Slido. You can see the link here in the slides, but also um, below your YouTube stream in the description. All accepted contributions receive the possibility to shoot a video. We compiled those into sessions, which are now represented on YouTube as playlists. Supplementary material for all contributions is also available on our website. To make all content as uh, available, as accessible as possible, we ask speakers to provide um, their content in Markdown or HTML slides. And also for contributed uh, talks, we have captions available that you can just turn on in YouTube. We encourage you to ask questions um, to, the, to the speakers uh, through uh, Slido for for um, the upcoming session that we will have in a minute. Um, and don't forget to look into the description uh, in, in the YouTube description below. Um, now, let me hand over to Janine, who will give you some information about the tutorials. Uh, thank you, Heidi. Hi, everyone. I'm Janine Harris. I am originally um, the co-chair of the St. Louis team and now uh, part of this global team putting this together. Um, we have 15 tutorials coming up with 25 uh, awesome instructors uh, and they start, the first one is scheduled for July 14th. Tutorials this year are hosted by groups uh, from Africar, Our Ladies and MyR. And these groups are on four different continents, including Africa, Europe, North America and South America. The dates, times and procedures for signing up are still being confirmed for many of the tutorials, but you'll see some of them um, on the list on your screen and you can find a little bit more information on the timing on our website. Um, we'll be adding more information to the website on how to sign up and when all of the additional tutorials are uh, as it becomes available. Uh, so check out our web page, the list, uh, the URL is at the bottom left corner on your screen. Um, or you can just go to the USAR 2020 website and, and search for um, tutorials. Uh, so now I want to turn things over to Toby Hawking, who was the chair for our two keynotes today. Uh, hi there. I'm going to share my screen. So here we go. So I've prepared a few slides for introducing Luke and Martin. And I'll make it full screen. Let me do that. All right. Presentation, yeah. OK, so yeah, I've been tasked with introducing Luke Tierney and Martin uh, Mackler. Um, and so I'm a assistant professor at the School of Informatics, Computing and Cyber Systems at Northern Arizona University in the United States. And um, so I did a little bit of research on the background of Luke and Martin for this introduction. And so the first thing that I did is I looked at the R project SVN repository. And when you look at the top 10 committers um, over all the commits that have been made to the base R source code, you see um, that both Luke and Martin are definitely in the top 10. And so Luke's right here with about 2,000 something commits over the years. And uh, Martin's up here with uh, 13,000. 
And um, yeah, I'm going to be presenting a few other figures uh, based on these data. And uh, you can go to see, if you want to see how I made these figures, you can see that on the GitHub here at tdhawk slash rdevel emails. But so yeah, to begin with Luke, he's a um, Ralphie Warham, pre professor of mathematical sciences in the Department of Statistics and Actuarial Science at the University of Iowa uh, from August 2002 to present. He was the author of the really innovative LISP, LISP stat system, which has amazing dynamic and interactive graphics that R still hasn't really been able to beat. Um, he joined R core in 1998, and he has numerous contributions to R computational infrastructure, such as the bytecode compiler, um, the alt-rep uh, framework, uh, the some uh, contributions to memory management, just to name a few. And uh, from my personal experience with Luke on the RDevel list, I've seen that he has encyclopedic knowledge of R internals. So I've seen quite a few uh, messages saying something like, I think there's some weird R behavior might be a bug. Is that intentional? And uh, often you'll see Luke uh, replying right away, yes, this is intentional to resolve this very specific bug that I worked on a number of years ago. So it's, uh, his, his uh, knowledge of the R internals is very impressive. And um, so, yeah, I did some analysis, a further analysis about like, um, you know, what his contributions to the R um, community look like over time. And it looks something like this, where, yeah, in the top panel, we see um, the number of commits to the SDN repository uh, as a function of time. Then the second panel, we see, you know, the insertions and deletions uh, in terms of the number of lines of code, insertions in green, deletions in red. And um, at the bottom panel, we see the number of posts on the RDevel email list. And so in terms of all three of these indicators, you see that Luke has been really a consistent contributor to the R project since as early as 1997, which is really a, where everything got started. So that's super impressive. And so for Martin, um, he's an adjunct professor at ETH Zurich. Uh, he joined R project 1995. Now he's an R core team member. He um, is an Emacs Speak Statistics core developer since 1997 and project lead since 2004. Um, he he uh, manages the R task view on robust statistical methods and maintains the recommended R packages matrix and cluster. He also manages the R um, uh, stat ETHZ CH mailing list. He gave an invited talk at USAR 2014. And on a more personal note, uh, he gave me a Bugzilla account uh, on bugs.rproject.org recently, and I'm sure he will do that for you too if you want. And um, I think he manages the rproject.org uh, web domain name and um, email alias aliases. So uh, thanks to Martin for giving me that rproject.org uh, email for my contributions to the Google Summer of Code R community. And when you look at Martin's um, contributions over the years to the R project, you, you see uh, similar trends of consistent um, contributions every month for like the last 23 years, which is super impressive, right? So again, in terms of commits to the SDN repository, um, insertions and deletions to the R source code and lines of code right here. And also in terms of number of posts per month on the um, R Devel email list. So, um, Again, these, these two guys are really um, uh, giants in, in terms of their contributions to the R community. And so uh, let's, let's all thank them for um, agreeing to give a keynote and for thank them for all their contributions to R over the years. So I'll, with that, I'll pass that off to, to Martin. Everybody, I'm, I'm waiting for Toby trying to unshare his screen. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, really honored by uh, being a keynote speaker and even the first of the CRC USR. I really want to thank the joint teams from St. Louis and Munich for organizing two conferences, first the uh, on-stage on conference and then having to switch to this online conference. That's a big thing. Thank you very much in the name of all the participants. 
Um, let me now share my screen here. Uh, and I think that will be good. So both my keynote and, and Luke Tienis have the same title, title, Developing R, Current and Future. Uh, my part one will only talk about current uh, things and only a few of them. And Luke will more talk about the future, but also some of the new innovations that were added to R400, which as you may remember, most of you came out this spring. Um, okay, now I have to move this out. Martin, we can't hear you right now. I must have muted myself. I'm really sorry when trying to move away the sharing stuff that is so horribly in my own view, way of view. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, Anyway, and the, the three main parts will be both about new things, uh, three times uh, new things in R40. And uh, two of them I've been heavily involved myself and the first one only marginally. Okay, about core R or R cores are, um, i.e. the packages that are, that come with R uh, and not, don't, you don't have to install. And here, this is a screenshot uh, really from the WWR project org webpage. And actually I want to give emphasis on these uh, three, these four entries uh, that you can all click from the page. I decided not to do it real time, even though that probably would work. The first is the contributors uh, entry. No, that's actually the one I'll, I'll do, try to uh, choose. Okay. And it does not work in full screen, so yeah. So I'll. S okay. Let me try here. Okay. So anyway, if you do that, uh, click that here on contributors, you get to this list. Uh, this is the R core team, the current R core team. Uh, the people who have right access to the R sources. Uh, there are twenty people all male, unfortunately, but um, I'm and Luke are here and, and many others. About two thirds of those are really very active and others are active in the R project, but less active with the R core uh, source score at the current time. Sorry, uh, the next one is what's new. That's uh, something you see, of course, on the web page itself about news. R402 came off, came out only about two weeks ago. Uh, in short, this time in short uh, sequence, we had two releases after the zero release that sometimes happen and it happened this time. Here is the news Twitter feed. But when, if you click here, actually you can, you get to this page, uh, which I can show here. Yeah, that's the one I wanted to show. Anyway, uh, it's what's new in R and the, the interesting thing is actually this, the one that I want to show you. Here is important announcements. Uh, the last one was that the conference the last one is from today that the use our conference has been open. But this file um, is really something I want to mention. Uh, one version of it you can see is the one here, which is actually starts with the changes in our devel. And, uh, and then we even have to scroll down to go to 400, which is the one I, I want to really uh, focus on today. 
and I'm returning to my slides. Then reporting box and the R block. Um, the new, to the news file, there is some other entry I want to show. Um, in the R console, you can always ask about news on R. Of course, uh, you need the version 4.0.0 or later to ask about the news in version 4.0, because this really is not going to the internet, but uh, to the R built-in version of the news data. And you can analyze them uh, to the word categories and more. Just uh, what were the significant user visible changes in R400? Usually we have a section here, user visible changes, but this time we had so many user visible changes because it was a major release going from the three X.Y series to the four series. And so we had to choose significant user visible changes and leave the other to the news and, and new features. Uh, this is one of, that I will talk about. Uh, and there are more I will just uh, show in a moment. Namely, here a little bit more entries about uh, how you can actually use R itself, like working with the DB that I created here. I can now call uh, the STR function, get a little, bit, a little bit information. So it's a data frame, but it actually also inherits from news database from RD class and another one. And it has a very special print method you can ask about here. And if you print it in, in your running R session, then actually a web browser is opened with the news that you've just seen. Uh, here, we don't do that. We say do browse equal false. And actually, if you do it within Pandoc or so, it will not open the web browser anyway. Now we see a little bit more, but not really. There is a new syntax for specifying raw strings. Is another important user visible change. Is that something Luke Tierney will talk about in his keynote after this one? The last uh, entry of this whole uh, section is the R blog I wanted to mention and, and show you about. The R blog is really R core and R foundation members or people close to R core writing about new things they plan to add to R or have added to R or are contemplated to add to R or change R with. So, uh, and, and the last few one, this is actually not even the last, there are three more. The, this one came out after R400. This one came out just immediately before R400. Uh, and this one well, I will talk about. That's the new in R40 and quite important. Paul Morell may talk about this at the R core panel after these two keynotes. And about this one, I will also talk in this uh, keynote talk. There, will, there is more. The last one here is use your, your help reviewing uh, bug reports. And I'll switch to that in a moment. Um, well, there's a slight more remark about the blog here. Uh, it's available on this URL. Uh, there is more in Thomas Caliboros uh, EROM 2020 keynote, which was a month ago, uh, and it has a link here. There is strings as factors I will talk about in this talk. There is this other one, uh, class matrix ray things and color plot I've mentioned already. And the last entry in this uh, introductory uh, section of my keynote is about R box. Uh, the software that the R box repository or issue tracker runs on is called Bugzilla. This predates any Git and other platforms and it's still in active use for many places and also for R. We can use your help with a box. And uh, Thomas Calibera actually wrote about this and this, this slide I basically uh, got donated by him. There were even two blogs. The first one was by Thomas and Luke uh, in, uh, in fall. 2019, or can use your help uh, reviewing bug reports. And then there was a second one thanking for, for actually doing bug reports. And I want to quickly try to follow this. Uh, and yeah, this is actually the one I didn't want to go. Okay. Yeah, but this is the one I wanted to go. 
So that was in already in December 2019, about three months after or two months after their first question. And here is an interesting graphic that shows you how nicely um, the effect was. The first blog post asking for people to help with RBOX. Uh, and then the increase in interactions with the RBOC database, that there is an API to Boxilla where you can get this data from. A special thank to these people who were active at, at that time. And in the meantime, there were others um, that I will also mention, Ellen Waring and Mikhail Kiriko were the two that have remained among the top contributors to the bug repository. Thank you very much to you. Uh, you can really help. There are only basic skills and hard work needed to help us find minimal reproducible examples to box. Many bug reporters are not so good about that, or they have long reproducible examples or not reproducible. Identify invalid reports uh, that can be closed because we typically forget about them if they are too boring. Uh, so that is a good help and then more technical skills needed and hard work again for special help, debug, analyze, confirm bugs, uh, pro create and propose bug patches and even more. And these four individuals uh, have really contributed most recently very much, uh, notably Elin and Sebastian, but uh, Mikhail and Benjamin as well. Thank you very much to your help to the R project by contributing to our box in Puxilla. Okay, that was the intro part. Now part one, an important change in R400 was the strings as factors equal false change. This is about data frame having one argument getting a different default, which actually does change behavior of data frame, read table, read CSV, and many of these functions. What is it about? So it's really the data frame and the read table functions that they have an optional argument called strings as factors that mostly you don't use or need to use, uh, but they have like all, all optional arguments, they have defaults and the default has been changed from true to false. Uh, after many, many hours of online discussion at USR uh, last year in uh, Toulouse, France, where, where our core meetings happened and we missed many good talks because we so much discussed about strings as factors and other important things. What are the consequences? Um, many data frames now, meaning as soon as you've started using R40, will have character instead of factor columns. Of course, that's not true for data frames that you load from saved R objects. Uh, or, or standard R data sets that are already in binary format, but it will be for data that you read, newly read uh, by using read table or read.csv, which just calls read table and similar functions. What is the consequence? The consequences are not grave in the sense that, for instance, LM as, as the most prominent statistical model function to do regression, multiple regression, even multivariate regression, GLM and so on, they produce a model matrix, as some of you know, from the, from the data frame and the formula, and they produce basically the same thing. But now there's a big change. The columns that are now of character instead of factors are automatically changed to factors. And that change is almost always the way it should be. Like in the model matrix, you get dummy variables and so on. But the factor levels depend on sorting by default, unless you are very careful and did much more than, than just calling LM on, on this data frame. It depends on the sorting. And the sorting depends on your locale. And the locale means your country, your language, and so on. And in some places in the world, uh, all the capital letters are before all lowercase letters. In other places, capital A is before lowercase a, but then capital B and lowercase b and so on. And there is even there are even more interesting things. So depending on the on the levels or on, on the values of your character vector, right? Your character data in your data frame column, the factor may get 
the levels in different orders, meaning the dummy variables are quietly different and the model coefficients, their order are sometimes even more may depend on exactly your country or language setup. That was when Peter Dalgar, one of the R core members, this just first brought up, many of us actually said, oh, okay, we didn't think about that. And that was one important reason why what you should know about and why we have done some more work for you to kind of prevent some surprises, but what I write here is still true. So you have to be aware that this can change. Uh, repeating again, because this is important, the conversion of character to fact can now no longer happens at data frame co uh, creation time by retable or other ways often, but it happens once you need dummy variables, once you need factors for statistical methods that eventually go via factors and factor levels. So when I say locale dependent in our language, this means what you see from sysget locale LC collate. Collate is about the collation order as it's called or how the alphabet is defined in, in, in along which you sort when you sort alphabetically. Okay, so the model coefficients or their sorting could depend on country language setup. Hundreds of CRAN packages actually needed to be updated because of this change, because their regression tests implicitly assumed some behavior. Maybe some of your data analysis or scripts need to be updated too if they should give identical results. Maybe they should not give identical results because the other results are true. Though it's just the ordering of some dummy variables and that's not always visible, often not visible. We also had to make data matrix smarter as somebody recently remarked and found out on the R devil mailing list, the data matrix is now smarter with character columns because character columns, data matrix is a function that takes a data frame and turns it into a matrix often a numeric matrix and nowadays character columns are coerced to factors and then factors are uh, coerced to numbers and so data matrix on one of these new data frames will return a numeric matrix whereas the old version of data matrix as soon as you have one character column you would get a character matrix back and that's not useful because data matrix really wants a numeric matrix if that is possible. Data function itself has to be tweaked a little bit because versions of it also read from text files, CSV and so on. And, and uh, yeah. Kurtonic wrote the whole R blog about uh, this I mentioned before as this worked, I can try it again. So, well, it doesn't work fast now. Strings as factor, that, that's the R block of Kurtonic that contains much more information uh, and, and the problems of sorting recommended reading if you're interested. Good. Well, here it says strings as factor is false. The default change from true to false. That's actually mm, a white lie or something. The truth is following. It's not false. It's much more complicated. And this is actually good that it's more complicated because it helps people in the transition if they have back compatibility problem with this change. The true default is really default strings as factors, as you can read if you do str on read table. It has too many arguments, I drew many dots here, but the, the real default is the, that. And by the way, there's another argument that is the default of not strings as factors, and uh, that's also important and relevant. And, and so the function default strings as factor, if you call it with no arguments, because it doesn't accept arguments, uh, then it is false. So in this sense, it's uh, it is false, but it's not because the function uh, default strings as factors is really defined the following way. It has no arguments. It gets the option strings as factors. And if that is a good logical value, it is returned. If not, well, it now takes false. If, if it doesn't exist, it, it now is false and this used to be true. And if it's still not logical, uh, if it's not null, but not logical, then the error is now the same as before. And this global option string as factor is now false and used to be true indeed. But 
Okay, so this is false. It's a global auction. That means for a few months now, well, till R4.1 gets out in about a year, you can still force the old behavior for back compatibility. But we will be pretty strict and that will probably 4.1 and 2.21, well, this is abolished. And well, I will just tell you why in a moment. So for the moment, you can still force this old behavior by using option strings as factually equal true on top of your R analysis script, uh, or even as part of your package uh, setup. That's not nice, by the way, if you do that, but it's possible to do. The help page says about these functions, right? This, uh, it's a function. This is the function default dot strings as factor. That's itself a public function, a documented function as, as it should be. But the documentation, the help page is actually the same help page as the one for data frame. It here says as a command default strings as factor is deprecated. It's not formally deprecated. You don't get a deprecation warning because we need it at the moment as a default. We cannot give a deprecation warning. So you can do this. You can, but you shall not, or you should not. Okay, that was not, well, the second to last message on this section. There's just one remark. Option strings as factor is generally not a good idea, has never been a good idea. We had allowed it um, for reasons. I want to give you my rule, and it's not only my rule, but uh, not everybody adheres to it. Options should really not be used to change the semantic of an R function. So what an R function accepts as arguments and returns as a result should depend on its arguments and not on a global option, ideally. Of course, options, the, the goal for options is to do something global, but the only thing you should do is output changes. So options width, options digits, uh, there are options to say how long uh, a list or a, a huge matrix should be displayed before it should be cut and many other platform dependent dependent on your screen or other things tweaking. So options should really just change the output, the screen output uh, typically and not the function. And uh, some people call pure functions in computer science functions without, without side effects. If as soon as if they depend on options, then they don't depend on their pure arguments anymore, but on global options. Reproducible R code, global options are very bad for reproducible R code because people typically don't say what options they set before giving you the code that should reproduce something. Okay, global options only use if really needed, if it really makes sense, or if it clearly has something to do with output formatting only. That was the message here. I get to the second part. Um, a matrix is an array, right? Um, and I see that I've used too much time, so I have to go quick. In R, before R, uh, this was actually not true. A matrix was not an array. Uh, very compact R code that shows this using set names with an empty first argument. So for arrays of dimension one to five, I ask is an array of the number seven of this dimension, is it an array? So does it inherit from array? And the answer is typically true for dimension one, three, four, five, and all larger dimensions, but it used to be false for dimension two. So for two dimension array, a matrix. So the most important array in R and, and typically other computer languages, the two dimensional arrays, they were not arrays in that sense, even though you can always use array to construct a numeric, mate, well, a matrix, not just numeric. So yes, um, this was changed for R40. It was also discussed before the change on the R devil mailing list or the well mailing list. And it's, this is, my blog is very much related about this. When you think class equals something, think again because that change has entailed that many packages needed uh, amending, fixing, because they, they had wrong assumptions. I'm showing here the current situation in R4 and newer. 
if you have a matrix and you ask for the class of that matrix, the answer is matrix mm -hmm. and array. Thank you. And of course, it now does inherit from array. That was not the case before. But class M, class may not be a string and it is no longer for all the matrices. And that killed many package code, which wrongly assumed that it was a good idea to have code like that. If class equal matrix, then something, or if class equals something. And if class, if X was a matrix, then this gave an error because if resulted in a logical vector of length two in that case, and uh, that gives an error. Gave a warning, but now an error in most cases. Okay, I'm skipping this part for the last few minutes. Um, the last section I will quickly get into is also a change in R40, was not listed among the significant user visible changes because it's not significant, but it's it's very cute and it's to my heart. I'm one of the R core people who is really interested in numerical details and, and uh, well, intricacies. I've written an R package called round just for introducing this change to the round function in RDVL and a nice vignette that you can look at. Well, I find it nice. Um, so rounding is about rounding a number or a ve numeric vector to so many digits after the decimal point. And we're talking about decimals and decimal point, but this is trickier than thought. Um, this is not trivial. All our double precision numbers use base two and are in base two and not in base 10. And that makes a huge difference to how to do rounding. And actually it gives raise to many questions. The most frequently R question ever is the R FAQ S7.731. And you can read about uh, things like that. And it's related. It's related to one of the bug reports, uh, which I'm now not showing you about artificial numerical error and so on. Here is the gist, well, it's a generalization of, of that bug report. Um, this function is not easy. We are rounding 55.5 to zero digits, 55.55 to one digit and so on. So the question is always what happens if you round a, a, a trailing five, right? That's the only interesting case because you have to either round up or down. Um, the results are here in the comment, the results for R less than 3.6, I mean, earlier 3.6, earlier than four. The bug reporter said these cases are correct and the others are incorrect because there is the so-called rounding to even thing, which I may get time to quickly show. We all learn in school how to round up and round down. And in school, you learn that yet you should round like that. You take the number and you add one half. Thank you, I have two minutes left. And and round and take the floor. Uh, but that's not good. And that's why on computers, there is round to even. Uh, quickly jumping format. If you do take these numbers and you do round to zero digits, you get this result. Minus 0.5 is rounded to zero, zero to zero. Plus 0.5 is also rounded to zero. 1.5 is rounded to two, but 0 0.5 is rounded down and 1.5 is rounded up. And that's the, and this one is also. So rounding to even means uh, ending five is rounded to an even number. Here zero, here two. So 0 0.5 is not rounded to one because one is an odd number. Anyway. One important message before I have to cl close, um, rounding to digits is actually easy in math. Mathematically, all double precision numbers are rational numbers and rounding to integer is easy. Well, I didn't show this, but this is in principle easy. And then rounding to, ten di to D digits is basically this operation. You first multiply if you round to two digits, you multiply by 100, round to an integer and divide by 100. That would be all easy if, if the computer could correctly do this operation, but it can't. Even division by 10 is most of the time not exact on a computer because the computer is a binary, has binary arithmetic. Here I show you that one divided by five is an infinite 
fraction in, in mm -hmm. binary arithmetic. Mm -hmm. Here is the rest. Okay, I think I close here. There are a few more uh, slides that you can download or you can read my blog about it. Thank you very much for listening and watching. There is some time for question and answering immediately now, if you have Slido questions and, and there will be more after the other keynote. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Martin. And uh, so I'll read a few questions for the next uh, five or 10 minutes. And yeah, so uh, the first question from Slido says, um, if I am concerned about reproducibility, what should I do when switching to R4? Is there a recommended workflow? Um, so I, I assume that this is mostly because uh, the strings as factors uh, thing that I mentioned. Of course, there is also the rounding that I mentioned. So people who relied on some of this rounding they also had to change their regression test. One of the more uh, active and famous R people was Jerome Ooms. Uh, in, he has a Java, a Java something JSON package there where he had a regression test that rounding to four digits of one number had to be this result and it became that result. I think you really always if you get a new zero release, you really should read the news a little bit. And they are not so easy to read. Take some time to read these news, the, the important user visible changes, and keep them in the back of your mind. Uh, and then it's good. If you have packages, they have regression tests. If you have package on CRAN, that's much better because these packages are tested against RDVEL. So against the next version of R long before it gets out. And if one of your regression tests breaks in the next version of R, you will be told about by the R, by the cron team. So that's one advertisement and one really very good reason why you should put your packages on cron or bioconductor because they have the formal tests against future versions of R for free. And you even get, you even don't have to watch it yourself. You get even told when things change and have an effect on your on your unit tests or, or examples. Yeah, Toby, maybe you have to tell if the, that's an answer to the question because I can't ask the original uh, answer. Uh, question. Yeah, well, I think uh, I think that maybe the, the uh, person who asked the question maybe was concerned about this whole strings as factors um, thing that you were talking about and how you know you could make sure that your code is uh, reproducible you know, if it was maybe written before R 4.0 and, and okay. they want to run yeah, it. Yeah, there is more to it. I should have said um, one thing is, of course, you you could write wrapper functions or you could for a while explicitly use uh, strings as factors equal, equal true or false in, in your functions. I, by the way, the R sources itself had a few regression tests that needed to be changed. And in some of them, I've added string as factors equal true, which is no longer the default, but I didn't want to change the rest of the example. So I explicitly changed it from a default, which was true to an explicit call, which contains strings as factor equal true. And in other cases, uh, I explicitly did uh, strings as factor equal false because that works, of course, everywhere. It's just the default that changed. As soon as you explicitly set that argument, you're fine. But of course, the problem is that other functions call data frame or other functions call read table, read CSV. And they may not even allow you to change one of these arguments. Yeah, that's, that's life. <laughs> we, we only do such breaking yeah, changes in the spring I, I... releases. <laughs> Maybe that if there's another question or otherwise I could, we could go on. Yeah, um, I guess this question might be relevant um, to what you were talking about um, with regards to, you know, contributing with the bug reports and everything. So it's, um, it says, what are the biggest challenges, obstacles our core faces and what can the community do to help? So I guess bugs is one of the things that you mentioned, but Maybe are there any other places where um, general members of the R community might be able to help you guys out? 
um, monitoring the traditional mailing list, notably the RDVAL one, which is the advanced one, or RDVAL packages. The young generation is, is not used to mailing lists so much, but uh, at the moment, this is still the way where we communicate and, and have time to listen. I think at the moment, the, the, the bidding for involvement with uh, helping to deal with bug reports uh, is, is still the main thing that I think we are happy for, for even having got help now in the last half year, having got much more help than previously. Yeah, there, there will be more things. Maybe uh, other people will, will give you ideas on the panel. Yeah, we, we do have about five more minutes, uh, four or five more minutes for questions, but I don't see anything that's really directly addressed to you. So I wonder if we can just keep going. Is that okay? Yeah, I think that that's good. I don't think okay. so. Um, so I'll turn me off. Yeah, I as well. So um, I already did a nice introduction for for Luke Tierney, so I'll ask Luke to come on. Okay, uh, I should have my video on. Um, go the screen share. And all right, um, I think I'm on now. Does that look good? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to add to uh, Martin's thanks to the organizing committee for doing this an amazing job of turning on a dime and, and make, making this work as a virtual conference. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, uh, to the, to the rest of it. Um, and thanks for Martin for, for his uh, uh, comments on, on the, the, some aspects of what's it, it changed in, in R4.0. I want to talk about a few additional things that are new in R4.0 and a couple things we've been thinking about recently for, for the future. Um, so, um, uh, my, I tend to work a lot on, on lower level things, some of which are user visible, others are under the surface. Um, and my guiding principle I try to follow is, is make R better, but hopefully not break too many things. Sometimes I succeed better than others, but uh, I'll talk about a few of the things that I was involved with um, in R4.0 and a few new things I'm thinking about. So the, the things in R4.0 are raw strings, as, as Martin mentioned, uh, global condition handlers. Uh, both of those are user visible, though not frequently going to be used, but potentially uh, useful. Um, and reference counting is something under the hood that um, you may not directly look at or notice, but can have some useful performance uh, benefits. And then we'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about some, some syntax uh, changes we're thinking about. Start out with some of these new features. So it, as you probably know, when you write a string in R, um, there are certain characters that you need to put a backslash in front of in order to get what you want into the final result. If, if what you want is this sequence of characters with a backslash representing a Windows path, um, you need to put in two backslashes in the R string to get that. If you want a regular expression that represents the pattern of A backslash B, in the regular expression world, you also need an escape. So that's why two backslashes. To write that in R, you need to escape each one and you end up with what some people call a leaning toothpick salad, obvious reasons. Um, if you want both kinds of quotes, you have to quote at least one of them. I think this is kind of okay up to a point with things that are this long, though it can get pretty hairy when you start doing regular expressions. Think about creating a LaTeX template that you're gonna fill a few things into. It's 10, 15 lines long, and you have to deal with all of those backslashes. That's what raw strings help you with. So the idea with a raw string is you have a syntax that allows you to tell R, 
or whatever language you're working in, that anything between these characters, these demarcations, is to be taken completely literally. No escapes, just, just do it. Um, lots of languages provide some sort of syntax. If you follow this link, it goes to a Wikipedia page that tells you what uh, Python does, which many of you know, uh, what C++ does, uh, Julia, other things. We went with something very similar to what C++ does for our 4.0. Um, this is doing it with our um, three examples that I just showed you. Uh, in each case, I'm using raw string syntax and R is printing back essentially the way you would have to write it if you were not using raw strings. So for the first one, I put my characters I want. In between, I start with an R, can be upper or lowercase, a quote on the outside, and then an open and close parenthesis. And then anything in between is taken literally. Same thing with my regular expression here. Same thing with my two different quotes. Now, the nice thing about the C++ syntax is that it's extensible in the way the delimiters work. And as a result, you can manage to adjust them if necessary to be able to cover any sequence of characters. So if I wanted this sequence of characters, the raw string expression for a, a path, or I'll, actually I'll do this one down here for, for that, that uh, two quote thing. Um, and I wanted that sequence of characters, what I would need to, what I would be able to do is put what I want into a raw string setup where I've added a dash here and a dash there. Now I get what I want. And if I want to do this, I can add two dashes. So you have some flexibility in the delimiters that means that anything can rep represent it. So if a practical way I would use this if I have a big chunk of text that I want to put into a raw string is I'd start with a simple form. If I get a syntax error, I just keep adding dashes until it works. And it will work for some number of dashes. And if you want slightly fewer dashes, you can also switch to the brace pair or the bracket pair as your delimiters. So it's, one, it's a facility that, now unless you work with regular expressions a lot, you probably won't use every day. But it's one of those, when you need it, you really, really appreciate not having to go in and put in all those backslashes or whatever that manually. Especially think about a template, maybe you do it once, but then you change the template, oh, you gotta fix the whole thing again. It gets really old really fast. So I've already find myself using it in a number of places. Okay, that's the uh, first item. The second item is um, global condition handlers. R actually has a very rich exception handling framework that's derived from the common list condition system. Um, typically you would use it with uh, you, the try catch and with calling handlers um, uh, functions for setting handlers for errors, warnings, or messages that are issued while you evaluate a particular expression. Um, what global condition handlers do is give you the opportunity to set for your entire session a handler that will, for particular kinds of errors or warnings or messages, do a certain thing. Um, this uh, Framework was uh, developed jointly by, by myself and uh, Leon Alonri from, from our studio. Uh, it's one of several examples where we have been collaborating with folks at, at, at our studio. And I expect we'll continue to do more of that. And I'll mention one other in, in, in a bit. Um, so um, what you can do with these things is uh, you can turn some warnings into errors, but not all, if that's what you want. Um, you can capture some errors where maybe you want to give some additional feedback, like it looks like you've made a spelling mistake. Um, and you can turn off some warnings and messages, but selectively, not all of them. Um, this will work best if the warnings that are being signaled are being single, signaled as structured warnings with a proper class. And uh, part of what I want to do is encourage you, if you write code that signals warnings or errors or sent or messages to really think about using a structured exception class that has a, has a class so that someone can select to 
things only of that class to, to, uh, to look at. Um, and you can also add as slots information that might be useful to a program catching the error to help figure out what's going on. Um, so typically you wouldn't write code to produce, uh, to, to add, install uh, a global condition handler interactively, except while you're getting it debugged. You typically put it in your global dot our profile or your project our profile. Um, it's also useful for IDE developers, which is why our studio is interested in it, why, why Lionel is involved, uh, for doing things like um, if a library call produces a uh, package not found error, um, catching that, maybe popping up a dialogue and, and um, saying, you know, did you think mean this package because it looks like you misspelled it? Or in the case of loading a workspace that tries to load in a namespace from a package you might not have, um, giving you the option to install the package. Um, and then in, in that case, the, the, the namespace loading code has actually been set up with what's called a restart so that your dialogue after you've loaded the package could let you say, please continue the computation of the, the workspace load in, in, in that case. Um, just as a quick example, slightly tongue in cheek, uh, a recent dplyr update, um, as a result of that, if you, you do a little group by something, uh, you get this friendly note that from my Twitter uh, following seems to not be entirely popular with everybody. Suppose you want to suppress that. Um, you could write a global calling handler, find one like this. It's capturing everything of class message. And unfortunately it has to do that because this is being signaled as a generic message rather than as a specific class. Um, and then it, I'm using a uh, raw string to put together a regular expression to capture that, at least a chunk of the, of the message. And if it, the message matches that, I'll muffle it or suppress it. Anything else is not going to be, it, 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 this function returns and will be processed by other global handlers or fall back to the default, which is to print it. Um, so this is not robust to, to select on, on uh, the message text. Um, it works fine in an English locale, but if the message is translated and you're in France, it's not going to work. But if, it, if the message was being signaled with a proper class, you'd be able to write something that's reliable and works no matter what the locale is. Um, okay, uh, those are the two user visible things that I wanted to talk about. Um, the lower level is, is the change to reference counting. It's a pretty substantial change, but for the most part should be unnoticeable. The R language, as I'm sure you're aware, passes its arguments to functions by value, which means if you have a vector, you pass it to uh, into a function, the function changes the third element. That doesn't change your vector that you passed in. It's as if a copy was passed to the function. Actually passing a copy would be ridiculously expensive. So what R does is when you modify something, if it's necessary to make a copy, R will. It has to know when it's necessary and it has to be approximate and conservative. Uh, the mechanism for deciding whether it is necessary to copy was changed from what it was before to reference counting. The old version did work. A big problem with it is that maintaining what it needed to know was distributed all over the base code. Whereas with reference counting, it's much more centralized, which makes it much easier to maintain. Uh, much harder to introduce bugs. Um, another benefit turns out that with reference counting, it's much easier when a variable goes out of scope to reduce the reference count on the value that is bound to. In particular, when function call returns, you can decrease reference counts. And I'll go through an example where that has the implication. I'll start out with the way one might write this. It's artificial, but it's, it's, it's representative of what you have in a lot of, of things, especially involving tidyverse code. Um, so I start with a fairly large data set, 100 million uh, element vector. And then my first stage is to 
call the replace function to change the first element, assign it to an intermediate variable, second element and the next stage, third element. Okay, it takes about a second on the computer I ran this on. Um, if I ran the same thing with a McGritter pipe, I get about the same performance. Most of that time is devoted to the fact that each one of these replace calls, either way, has to make a copy of that vector because it's got multiple references to the vector. Now, if you rewrote this call like this, a nested call, um, the first stage does a computation, passes it to the second stage, does its computation, passes it to the third stage, three times as fast because only the first stage has to copy that vector. The result that's passed through no longer has any references to it, so it becomes modifiable in the second stage and again modifiable in the third stage. So this is a, an automatic performance benefit that we get from reference counting if we're willing to write the code this way. Now, I'll come back to this. Let me switch gear now to looking at some new things. Um, now, whenever you think of a new thing, especially at this sort of general purpose level, there's a tension between do you put it into base or do you let it be in a package? Advantage of being in base from a user point of view is it's always going to be there. You don't have to remember to put in a package. Um, a disadvantage from the a disadvantage even from the user point of view, packages can be updated much more quickly. Um, from our point of view, as, as our core developers, um, there are many, 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 many package developers out there. There's only a few of us. If we can offload this the work of maintenance on somebody else, we have time to do other things that will, will, will help you. Um, but there are certain things that only can be done in base. One of them is changing syntax, and the other is changing internal data representation. So I'll try and talk a little bit about some of each. Um, so two syntax extensions we're thinking of. One is a notation, shorthand notation for anonymous functions. Another is possibly a, a base level pipe operator. Some people think this is overly verbose for writing something as simple as that. Not everybody agrees with that, but it is certainly a common feeling, which is why Tidyverse has introduced some, to me, not very satisfactory approach based on, on uh, formulas. These are some options we're thinking about. They're all based of loosely on what some other languages do. This is like Haskell. This is like MATLAB. A uh, number of things do this one, but it, it's actually hard to get this to work right with our parser. So probably we'll go with one of the other two if we do with any of these. It's not, not clear yet. Um, there are advantages to both. Mostly you'd probably use this in map and apply functions, but it can also make try-catch expressions more readable. Second thing to think about is a pipe. Um, McGritter is very popular. Um, it um, turns out, I didn't really realize this until recently, a number of other languages are adding pipes to, to them. There's a discussion of several options for the JavaScript language that I've linked to here. Um, and the discussion also points to what a number of other languages are, are doing, like Ruby, for example. Most use this symbol, so that's what I'll use in the examples. There are some issues with the McGritter pipe. Um, one of the biggest ones is if you have a bug and you try and look at a stack trace, it is a mess because it's got all the plumbing around it. Um, it's also difficult, it, impossible, I think, to, make, be, to maintain the McGritter design and get that efficient translation to the efficient version that, that is now enabled by uh, of, of that, that uh, replace calls that's enabled by the reference count change. I should have mentioned that that uh, nested call thing is just as slow as the other approaches in R3.6. Um, okay, uh, there's another, uh, sorry, there's another yeah, sort of aesthetic problem that some people have with the pipe is that this implicit passing of the argument requires a lot of cognitive load as you're debugging and as you're teaching. It'd be easier if it was more visible. Um, the problem I personally have with my eyesight is that the placeholder that they use for the case when you don't want it to be the first argument, the dot, is the single smallest glyph you can produce on a computer screen. And it's not a great choice for the, 
distinguishing the one out of many steps that's different. Okay, so another collaboration uh, starting or, or another at least contribution from, from folks in our studio. Leonel Henry again and Jim Hester have suggested they implement the pipe as a syntax transformation, which requires a parser level change just like the anonymous functions. This would give you both the efficiency because it just translates for you that one pipe, the pipe expression into the nested function calls and it gives you a clean stack trace. Um, number of things to think about, especially related to having a placeholder. Do you want one at all? Um, if you have one in a syntax translation context, allowing it to happen in multiple places or anywhere other than top level on the right hand side creates real problems. So th that's something to think about. We've been bouncing this around for a bit and I think we kind of converging on two different options. One is really simple to implement, really simple to apply, uh, to, to describe. It uses the pass, implicit passing by first argument, uh, as first argument, but no placeholder. If you want to pass things to LM, you use an anom anonymous function. So empty cars goes into a subset, result goes into an LM captured through D input into the data. Especially combined with a, a, an anonymous function syntax, pretty readable. The other option we're thinking about, okay, let's have a placeholder. It has to be only once, and we'll say it has to be once. So require the placeholder once and only once on the right-hand side at top level. Then this example gets turned into, this looks like a regular call to subset. The underscore, which is used as a more readable placeholder is where the left-hand side goes in this case that gets piped into LM. In the LM case, the result goes over here. So there are pros and cons to both approaches. Um, the first one is by far the simplest to implement. This one's not too bad. Uh, the, the hardest, well, hardest part is getting it so that the error messages make sense uh, in, in this one. But we're thinking, I'm not sure if this will happen, but we're gonna think about it, probably make some decisions early, early August. Uh, there are really real benefits of going there, both in terms of that stack trace and in terms of, um, of the efficiency that you can get. You can, in a, in a long pipe, you can avoid copying, which as you saw in the trivial example, can really make a difference. Okay, final example, uh, I, I thing I wanna mention is we're starting to think about the issue of 32-bit integers being restrictive. In R, the integer data type is 32 bit, so it has a range of plus or minus two to the 31. It's big, but not big enough. Um, if you do a basic arithmetic operations, they overflow to NA. Sometimes that's already been too restrictive. With the number of cases we've decided you overflow to double, um, that works, but it creates a, 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 a lack of type stability that some people find, find upsetting. Um, a key in thinking about this is we don't want to do something that means every single piece of C code that works with R has to be rewritten. That's just not viable. Um, so let me start a little bit by thinking about the R level. Um, and the, the bottom here is really for me, from the point of view, when I'm working with R, I want to think about one kind of integer. We're still going to have to have the 32-bit one underneath just to keep legacy code going. But I don't want to have to think about, this is a light 32-bit integer. This is a different kind. It has to be all integers. Now, in terms of the larger range we support, there's actually one magical cutting point that's worth, cutoff point that's worth thinking about, plus or minus 2 to the 53, because that range is the range that's exactly representable as a double precision number. So you can go integer to double the integer and you get the same value back. You go outside the range, that's not true anymore. If you wanna go outside the range, the logical option is two to the 63. Uh, that, that's a 64 bit integer. Um, but from a data analysis, mathematics point of view, integer are not, uh, integers are not limited. In principle, we could support 
700 digit integers if we overflowed into big nums on the rare occasions that they occur. Um, I'm guessing if we do things, we'll go in stages and we'll start with just one of these, but at least keep the option open to go in this direction. Um, um, from on the internal side, um, again, we need to support the 32-bit integer. Ideally, code, current code, if it's handed 32-bit integer data, should continue to work just fine. If it's handed 64-bit data, there are kind of two directions. One is we could let it, maybe with a warning, get a 32-bit view in which everything outside of the range is turned into NA. And the other is we just to throw up our hands and signal an error. I think we'll have to play around with that and see how comfortable either one feels. Um, at this point, we're very, very early in thinking about this. Um, I'm hopeful we'll at least have some proof of concepts ideas by the end of this calendar year. I don't think anything is likely to make it into the 2021 release, but I'm hopeful we'll see something in the in the 2020 to release. Um, at least that that's, yeah, that's my hope. Um, all right, so those are some of the things we're thinking about. Um, there are also some things involving improving the compiler and performance, um, possibly native code generations that are farther back on the back burner and the back back burner, so to speak, in my mind, at least. But um, anyway, thanks very much for listening. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of the conference too. I will unshare. Okay, well, thanks very much, Luke, for your nice presentation and for respecting the time. So you're actually um, four minutes ahead of schedule. So we've got plenty of time for questions. Sorry. <laughs> Not good for you. So um, I'll go to the Slido for the first few questions. Um, so the the top question is from Henrik Minkson, and that's, um, did you ever consider to support also uh, raw string syntax without brackets? So that's uh, inside of the, the outside quotation marks. You mentioned that you can put the, you know, opening or closing brackets or parentheses or some other um, delimiter uh, after those quotes. Did you ever consider some syntax without uh, those additional um, delimiters inside of the quotation marks? Sure. Uh, I mean, when I'm thinking about it, I, I mean, when I sat down, I'd say, fine, I've been wanting to do this for a while. I sat down, originally I was thinking, Python does it one way, let's have a look at that. But I looked around at what other people are doing, and the C++ one just makes so much more sense. You can actually cover all possibilities. Yeah, you have to put the extra brackets in, but it's not a big deal. Um, so, Yes, and I dismissed it. <laughs> That's the short answer. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Hi, I'm Henrik. I'm thinking about that too. Um, and also, I was wondering. So the you know Python also has this um, this triple quote syntax, which is kind of uh, but it's not the same as the raw string, but it's kind of another like string related uh, parsing functionality, right? And I don't think R really needs that though, because we already are able to support the multi-line strings, right? Yeah, th th there's differences there um, uh, with a multi-line. I mean, there, there, there are certain kinds of things that, that could be nice. Um, you know, one of the things is if, if, if you put down a multi-line string, most of the time you'd want the second line to be aligned with the beginning of the first line. Um, uh, but getting that to happen is a little tricky. Um, it might be nice to have a way of doing that. But um, one, one of the things I need to keep in mind though, is this has to be implementable with a reasonable effort and maintainable with a reasonable effort. And it, C++ actually is, allows you to have you know, A, B, C, D between the quote and the open parentheses. And on the other side, I decided just dashes was easier and sufficient. So yeah, we have to balance how many wonderful things you can do with, um, it has to be maintainable with a reasonable amount of effort. So I think, I feel that we got a pretty much a sweet spot. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, there are other things we can do, um, but. Yeah, that's definitely a nice feature. And, and so, yeah, if I can um, uh, follow up again. So, so if I understand correctly, it's 
only those open and close parentheses brackets as well as the dash which are supported there and there, there's not any other characters which are supported is that for right the for the delimiters yes yeah so so yeah, okay. so well you, you you do have the option instead of parentheses to use braces or brackets uh, and that sometimes will be enough to avoid writing in dashes but but basically it's you, you get the delimiters right and then everything in between just goes. Um, I mean, I've recently been doing pasting in some source code, which typically has strings in it. And it's just really, really helped. I just have to fix the things on the outside and then not worry about it. And I haven't yet gone back to some of the LaTeX templates I've created, but I know that's going to be infinitely easier than it was the last time. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I'm a big user of regex too. And so that'll be super helpful there. Um, so yeah, for the next question, uh, this is actually a question that I posted. And so it's a question about the reference counting that you were talking about. So I was just wondering if it's more or less uh, efficient in terms of time or space than the previous mechanism. And um, more generally, you know, what do you as our core developers do to systematically benchmark or monitor how changes to the R source code would affect the time and space requirements of various uh, R functions? Um, it's slightly more overhead, uh, but it's more than worth it to me. Uh, we uh, typically when I make changes along those lines, others have made different issues. Um, I tend to know where it's going to make the most difference. And I carefully benchmark examples of that and look at, okay, it's basically, I know roughly what the worst case is going to be. Um, and I'll benchmark that and look at, okay, it's a 10% hit. Am I willing to pay that price? And in this case, I don't remember what it was, I think it was more like 5%, but the, ability to avoid introducing new bugs, which the you kept having problems with that with the old one and finding the old one was based on you had to re, uh, remember to do something and finding places where you didn't do something is much harder than looking for places where you did something and you did it wrong. Uh, it's just a it, from a main the main reason I started on it was a maintenance point of view. It was just mm -hmm. driving me crazy dealing with some of the things that were being introduced sometimes by me sometimes by others because it's really was really hard to keep in your mind what you needed to do and the reference counting just makes that much easier but it turns out it also has this other benefit that we can get significant efficiency improvements in certain circumstances because of not automatically bumping up the it may need to be copied next time flag um, there are lots of other examples, but this is one of the probably the most realistic ones. Um, generally, I, I will also run tests across a lot of CRAN packages, mostly for the purpose of making sure that there are no errors, but I also look at the timings. That's not very good uh, because what's in crit tests and examples is not representative of what people actually do, but it's something. Hmm. Yeah, I did. benchmarking is notoriously difficult. I mean, I have that problem with my own packages as well. Um, uh, so maybe, uh, yeah, ju just to follow up on that. Um, so I mean, the changes that you talked about with the new reference counting mechanism, these are all uh, totally transparent to even our package developers who are using the dot call interface, right? So they're just going to be using the same protect, unprotect as usual. And under yeah. the hood, yeah. you're going to be doing something different, right? Yeah. They, they, I mean, they, you still, as a package author, if you're working on C code, you absolutely have to respect the mutability rules. So there, there's two macros that I introduced in process of transition. One is, is uh, maybe referenced and maybe shared. Um, as a rule, you should never modify something without duplicating it. For you, you, if you if you see something as maybe referenced, you, you treat it as read only. 
if you see something that's maybe shared, think really, really hard about, because that basically means that it, that it, uh, it, it has uh, more than one uh, reference to it. Um, now, maybe shared you absolutely don't want to touch, but uh, if it's not maybe shared, but maybe referenced, be really, really careful. Um, I'm getting confused about what I'm doing. I have to write things down more carefully, but, <laughs> but it, it is subtle. But the key is that our objects, if they're shared, cannot be mutated. If you know you own all the reference to, to it, you know, there are three references and you have all of them, yeah, maybe it's okay. But even that, if somebody enters a debugger can cause problems um, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, our level debugger. Uh, so it, that's the main thing people have to be careful about. That was true before and it's true now. To some degree, because the reference counting lets less copying happen in the internals, there are things that used to copy that protected you against messing up that no longer protect you against that package level. Um, there were a lot of those that we found as we were testing this, uh, that. Uh, uh, running through CRAN and Biosy packages and where I communicated with, with uh, package authors about it. Um, best of my knowledge, we stomped out most of those now. But, but that so, is one so thing that people get wrong a lot and uh, be good to write something about it if we had time. Okay, so if I understand correctly that there are actually a couple of new um, uh, C level functions that uh, our package developer might need to learn, like this maybe shared thing that you were talking about. They're, they're not actually new because the reference counting has been in development for well, probably five years um, for a number of reasons it didn't get done till then. Um, so they've been in our, the extensions manual for a long time um, and, and they should be used. Uh, most people, you know, they'll, they'll create an object. If they modify it in their code, they create something with maybe numeric 20 or something like that, pass it down. Okay, that's fine. Um, they know what the reference count is going to be. But, but if you're not careful about it, and some of the things that RCPP used to be doing with conveniently providing you with certain kinds of wrappers, which were producing re references that you could no longer distinguish easily between I can modify this and I can't, we're creating some you know, issues. I don't know whether that's been changed or not, but it's something you have to be careful of if you get down to the sea level. And, uh, and also I, I heard you say that maybe with this new mechanism, um, you're not making as many copies as you might have done before. So actually that might result in some efficiency improvements to some code, sure. right? Sure, sure. I mean, in a sense, that, that example I gave is, is a case where you used to copy, but you don't anymore. Um, uh, and there, there are other examples like that. The, the example I gave, I don't think there's any way that no longer copying is going to result in things in package C code getting in trouble that was being protected. Of, I mean, there are a number of cases where we make efficiency improvements, that re, especially ones that reduce copying that end up resulting in, in exposing, sometimes within R itself, but also within packages, exposing bugs that previously were masked because it got copied first anyway by something else. Um, so that is that is a risk of working at the sea level. Uh, but it's okay. Those it sounds like those things should have been fixed anyways. So um, yeah, to, to follow up, um, we've got a, another question from Henrik related to my question. It says. Um, was there ever a comparison of CRAN total check times before and after reference counting being introduced? So for example, can you make a statement like overall CRAN checks now run 20% faster? Um, they would not run 20% faster. I <laughs> At this point, I do not no longer remember. I believe what I did was a run that looked at it and they weren't different enough for me to get. No, actually, I did. I did screen, looked at ones um, that were outside of maybe a 5% window. And uh, uh, in some cases, there were bugs that needed to be fixed. 
on one side or the other. So there was, we do that sort of thing. Um, I, I at least do it. I, I have the setup, Tomas Calibera has a setup, a few others have, have a setup to just run across all CRAN packages. And, and I typically do that when I think it might matter, um, mostly for correctness, but also on occasion for, for timing. And yes, I did do that with, uh, uh, with, with, with this as well. But it's really hard to make meaningful statements about overall anything because a lot of packages on timing, because a lot of packages run in 60 seconds and then there are ones that run in three hours or whatever you let the time you give them. And so they're, they're very, very different animals and you have to think about how you compare, compare them. Um, so, but we, we do do these runs across, you know, it, it generally takes me uh, about a day to do a full, you know, baseline run and then another day to do a run on the new code and then make the comparison. So there's a limit to how often I'll do it, but we do, we definitely do that. Mm -hmm. That is a big benefit of having the accessible source code on CRAN. Um, and it gives us the app. Also, and Tomas as well, all of us, when, when we find that we think is a package problem, uh, a, a, an error in the package, we'll communicate with the authors and, and suggest, point out what, that there's an issue and suggest that they make change before it becomes a, before they, they get to the point where CRAN automatically sends them a message. Um, won't always catch this, won't always do it, but usually I will, I will do that. And Tomas does a lot of it as well, and I, others do too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we still have about uh, 15 minutes for questions. So I'll keep going um, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, so yeah, we have a question uh, from uh, from Klaus that hasn't really been uploaded a lot, but I think it's kind of relevant to what you've been talking about. So um, that's uh, it's about um, special syntax for other things than uh, raw strings, like um, raw vectors or unsigned integers. Did you ever think about um, adding some kind of special syntax for those things? Short answer is no. Um, I'm not sure it would be a good idea. Um, one thing about raw syntax, uh, about raw strings is they produce strings. So what you, you don't, the, the, the representation that R has doesn't know that it came in as a raw string or care. And if you do something like an unsigned integer, you, you since start having to think about that should probably be something that becomes, that, that, that at the R level, you know this is intended to be an unsigned integer. And I can't speak for everybody. If I'm working in R, I don't, I want to think at the level of integers and real numbers approximated by doubles and focus on analyzing data. I don't want to think about unsigned integers, eight byte integers. I have to think about that at the C level, but I do not want to think about it when I'm working on data. So if, if, if you're talking about something that would produce a, a new kind of R object, I would tend to avoid doing that. That's, that's my view, mm -hmm. unless there's a really good reason for it. You know, like we introduced the raw vector at, at some point and that is useful, but I'd be very careful about adding a new, a new data type that thinks through carefully about whether it's going to just complicate my life as an R user and, and other people's life, or is it enough to justify it? Okay, so uh, I guess we'll move on to another question. And uh, I think this one is more related to uh, to what Martin was talking about when he was discussing like the, the bug reports. So um, it says, what sort of expertise is needed to contribute to R outside of bug reports? And similarly, are there any succession plans for R core members, i.e. a plan for bringing in new members before any longer term members leave? So maybe Martin, you can take that question or? Yeah, we, we have talked about it within our course several times. 
Um, ideally, this would come up again at the panel when, all, when a much larger <laughs> fraction of our core will be present. Uh, but yes, we. One thing that one can look at is how our, our core members have entered over time, and the usual thing that we said is people contributing patches to the sources that were good and became too ex so extensive that it was more work for some of us old R cores to enter rather than having the new person become an R core member. Um, right? So it was more convenient if this person who, who gives who does good propose good changes to do the changes him or herself rather than sending them to one of us and that person have to understand and doing them. Uh, and the, yeah, so so we would want to help people become as good R programmers that they could do that. This is this is a hard thing. It has something to do with tutoring. It has something to do with uh, with being strict and being encouraging at the same time. We haven't a solution to this problem, but we are very much aware of it. And I think it would be nice yeah. when we are in the panel that uh, we can dis could discuss it in a, in a large in this somewhat larger group than just uh, me or, or me and Luke. Yeah, sure. Um, but I may, maybe you could address briefly the other part of that question, which was, you know, what sort of expertise is needed to contribute to our uh, you mentioned, you know, the expertise of creating minimal reproducible examples, but I mean, are there other contributions that people can make, you know, with, who have more or less skills? So, so just to contribute useful bug reports or to the bug or, repositories then? Not necessarily to bug reports, but uh, in general, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, maybe Luke, you understood better how this question is related to bug reports only or to become our core member eventually or not. Uh, yeah, I think it's, I, I, the reality is most of the current our core members work a lot at both the C and the R level. Um, but that's not essential. And I can certainly imagine going forward that there may be someone who really wants to focus on R level code to do, let, let's say the LM world or something at the R level. Um, so it, it's, it, it would be, it's possible for someone who really doesn't want to go near C code. And there's good reason not to, all the things we talked about um, could, could become, uh, get to the point where it's, it, it really makes more sense to have them make those code modifications themselves and have us do it. Um, so there, you know, so some people might also want to become fairly expert at, at some aspects of the C code without necessarily caring that much about the R level syntax and, and being becoming, I mean, you have to know the basics, but not necessarily be an expert at it. We, except what I'm saying is we, even though most of us tend, well, most of us tend to work mostly on one area, but from time to time go almost everywhere. Uh, that's not essential. Some, someone who really is good at our programming wants to focus on some particular subset, uh, let's say at the stats package. Um, I think it would make sense for, could potentially make sense to have someone as an R core member who just does that. And um, we don't typically give people right permission to only this section. And, and, but yeah, part of what's needed for someone to actually join our core is the judgment not to go into places that you're not comfortable with. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, but I, I guess, I, I guess, I guess that's all. Question yeah, yeah. Was, I, the way I interpreted the question was more like, you know, what can we do just as regular members without being a part of our core to do contributions? So maybe like submitting patches and what kind of expertise mm. would be needed to, doing for doing that but i think you've already discussed that for yeah bit, yeah so. yeah yeah um yeah so going down in the list of questions we've got about five more minutes um i've got a question from john nash hi john uh it says 
numerical analysts have been doing a lot of work on low precision, half or less numbers. Uh, I don't expect our core to be supporting these soon, but I wonder if they have been noticed or talked about. I think some of us have noticed it, and I think it, it's related to the GPUs partly and they being so fast for some operations like machine learning, which is close to statistics. And, but we haven't talked about plans to, to uh, make those part of, of our level uh, yet. I mean, one, one thing that may throw in some interesting wrinkles is Apple's move to uh, start pushing ARM processors and uh, if I understand correctly, Brian Ripley has done a lot of looking into this, and I definitely am not up to speed on it yet. But one of the issues there, I think, is that uh, they they don't properly, I mean, they C, I think, requires you to have a long double, but I think it means exactly the same thing as a regular double on the arm, uh, if I understood correctly. Uh, so that's not quite the same as going into the, what I think John's addressing, but it's kind of similar in spirit that to some degree for almost 20 years, doubles have meant exactly the same thing on all platforms. And that's changing with the GPUs on the one side, with the ARM processors on the other. Um, so there may be some more changes coming down the pike than, <laughs> than we've been used to dealing with in a while on the numeric side. OK, so another question um, uh, that's kind of on the bottom of the list, kind of related to these kind of questions about different data types is um, um, it would be great not having to think about the number of bits, you know, you were talking about not having to think about unsigned integers and uh, stuff like that. So what about arbitrary precision integers like Python has? Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at with a big num idea. I, I for, to me, the most natural way to place to move to with integers from the, from the R level would be the integers are of unbounded size. Internally, they'll be implemented as a 32-bit or a 64-bit integer, but um, as, at the R level, you don't need to care. Uh, there, there, it, there is this important two to the 53 threshold. Um, there's I'm sure more code than we could possibly think hiding out there that implicitly assumes you can convert an integer to a double back to an integer and get exactly the same result. And that's just not possible as soon as you go out that outside of that threshold. Uh, from then on, my ideal would be if we can resolve that, and I think that's going to be as hard as anything else, my ideal solution would be that an R integer can will typically internally have 32 bits. Sometimes it'll have 64 bits because those are the you know, efficiently manageable things at the hardware level. But sometimes it'll have 157 digits and I don't really have to care in the way I use it. Be mm. At least for basic functions, it will just work just like in Python. One of the challenges with, with you know, Python is a scalar oriented language at its core and R is not. R is vector oriented. So you, you always have the issue that you have a vector of like 10 and you one of them is 300 digits. The others are one, two, three, four, and five or something like that. How do you deal with mixing that kind of thing? Um, mm -hmm. You know, it would be awkward in some sense if you had to converge everything to a big num. If you're in the end only gonna look at the first two elements and the other one that's 100 digits long, you're never actually gonna look at. That, that's an issue Python never has to face. Um, hmm. We have kind of a similar issue in designing the question of what does square root of minus one produce? Well, it would be easy to produce square root of minus one as a complex, but square root of minus one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, make the whole thing complex because of that one. That's why what we currently do is make it an NA. Yeah, a lot of things get more tricky when your fundamental data type is a vector rather than a scalar. Okay, so last question then, and we can just answer this really quickly in the last minute. Um, do larger than 32 bit um, uh, integers mean that we will have also larger size vectors? Because there's a, a limit on the size of vectors, right? But we already do have yeah. larger vectors uh, supported. 
um, there's a, a big issue that has to be resolved is, is the, how to connect and where there will be breaking changes is in talking to LAPEC and LINPEC because those you can either run as we do as a, accepting 32-bit integer inputs or 64-bit integer inputs. Now, the way we've done things with the large vectors is most of the, we, we, we limited the number of columns and number of rows to be 32 bits, but the product can be very large. And that actually works well with almost all of BLAS and LINPEC, except the comp, some of the complex stuff. Um, when we go to 64-bit integer support, we have to switch to a 64-bit integer LINPEC BLAS. And like I said, that's going to break stuff. But then we won't have any more limits on the size of vectors or the number of columns and number of rows you can have. Um, so right now you could already have a data matrix that has more than two to the 32 elements in it. It just as a matrix can't have more than two to the 31 minus one rows or more than two to the 31 minus one columns. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So I think that answered the question pretty well. And um, I think we're up at time finally. Thanks for taking all that time to answer all those questions and to give those sure. uh, very interesting talks. And so now we're at the end of our discussion period and we've got a 15 minute break before we go to the R core panel. So uh, let's thank our speakers again and uh, thank you. see you guys in 15 minutes.
Okay, everyone. So we're ready to start again. Uh, Martin, please take it from here. Martin Plummer? Yes, sorry, I was muted there. <laughs> so uh, welcome everybody to this um, our core panel discussion. Um, my name is Martin Plummer and uh, with me today, uh, we have uh, quite a few members of the our core team. Um, Thomas Calibera, Michael Lawrence, Robert Gentleman, Martin Michler and Luke Tierney, who were given the keynotes earlier. Uh, Simon Obernack, Paul Morell, Kurt Hornick, and uh, also present are Uwe Ligas and Peter Dalgard, who are, who are not advertised, but who have joined us. So um, let's turn to the Slido questions and answers. So I'll, I'll take them to the, from the top, according to the number of votes that I have. Um, are there, this is from Toby Dylan Hawking. Are there any plans on moving from S subversion to Git? So uh, my colleagues need to uh, unmute themselves before they can talk. I would say there definitely have been discussions, uh, particularly around GitHub uh, as, as one of the more salient reasons for, for, going, uh, for moving to Git. Uh, and so this is something around, you know, we, we've talked previously and, and we'll talk later in the panel around our uh, desire to encourage more community engagement. And we think that might be one way uh, to address that. And so it's definitely something we've been considering. Does anybody else want to add something on, on that question? No, doesn't look like it. Okay, so uh, moving on. For many uh, people in data science, uh, they believe that R is better than Python in the same way that Betamax was better than VHS. What can we do to make sure R doesn't end up as the Betamax of data science? Now that reference is so old that maybe it, it needs some explaining. These were two competing formats for home video recording in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, and because of uh, networking effects and uh, lock-in, uh, VHS ended up as the, as the standard that we all use, but it wasn't necessarily technically the, the, the best solution. So that's, that's basically a question. Is there a risk though of, uh, of R being uh, crowded out by, by Python? And I, I guess I guess I might hand that to Luke because Luke referred earlier to some of the the differences between R and Python. Python being essentially a scalar-based language and R being a vector-based language. I don't know if you want to to expand on on, on that point, Luke. Um, I mean, I, data science as a concept gets gets changed as a lot, and and realistically, there's many different kinds of data sciences, and I I can't see are being replaced by Python in, in the more statistical and statistical modeling oriented direction. There's just more expertise on that kind of stuff in the R world. Um, the situation is quite different because there's not a pressure for every, in the same way as with, with a video um, format, there's not the same pressure that everybody needs to get on the same page. Uh, there are, isn't really that big benefit to it. Um, I don't see use of 
Python in certain areas overtaking R anytime soon. In other areas, for any number of reasons, Python is always going to be a, a, a bigger player. Um, I'm not terribly worried about it. I mean, think about it this way. Even if the number of R users got cut in half, there'd still be a whole lot of them. Maybe, uh, Martin, if, uh, you know, another thing, people should just be using languages that are really, you know, sort of appropriate for the task that they have in front of them. And, you know, every language has strengths and weaknesses. So I don't know that we're going to end up in a world where one or the other will dominate, right? It's going to be, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? And, and what are you comfortable with? Yeah. I agree. And I think, uh, you know, from, from the our core perspective in terms of what we can actually do, I think if we kind of look at why R got here in the first place in terms of, you know, being built by statisticians for statisticians and, you know, remaining, you know, focused on, you know, what people actually need, what are the practical needs that we as data scientists or statisticians need to get our work done and just, and just keep up with those needs. I think, I think we'll be in a good place. Yeah. I, I also wanted to uh, kind of back up what, what Luke mentioned and, and you too. I think there are quite a few people doing statistics, uh, data science, that don't think of R as a language. They think of R as a system to do data analysis, graphics, and not primarily as a language. And you can use R as a, Fun as a selection of function calls that give you what you need and that you understand kind of, but it's really visual pattern matching that you do and you don't understand it really as a computer language because you're not a computer science person at all. You're a scientist who wants to, to do a, a decent statistical analysis. And I think you can, people learn or that to use that way and they cannot learn Python that way. For Python, it's clear that this is a computer language, much more clear than for R. At least the reason is, as Michael said, it was written for statisticians uh, to do statistics and not primarily for people who want to have a fancy computer language to do something. That That's one of the strengths that the more sophisticated Python gets, uh, I think makes it even harder to, be, but I don't know. I, I think that there's definitely, we have a, a large audience, unfortunately not of computer scientists, not of people who are close to computer science. In some sense, people who really think about data pretty well. Okay. Thank you, everybody. That's that's a fairly comprehensive set of answers. And I don't see anybody else raising their hand to talk, so we'll, we'll move on to the next question. Um, <clears throat> ah, um, is there a plan going forward to increase the diversity among the R core group? Uh, I think this is definitely an issue that we're aware of. Uh, so the real question is, um, what, what, what can we do to increase the diversity of our core. Uh, no one's jumping in here. So there's a wider there's a wider issue about how people become our core members. And I think it's probably a good idea to talk about that as well, um, because there, there isn't really a formal procedure, uh, but there is a process of uh, making contributions to the base R code that become more and more important uh, until the contributor is, is considered to be someone who can make those contributions autonomously without a member of our core um, uh, mentoring or supervising the process. So that's uh, historically been the way that people have become uh, our core members. But uh, we're aware of, of the fact that uh, we're, uh, we're getting older as well. Uh, I don't know what the median age of an R core member is, but uh, it's not young. So uh, in terms of uh, age, in terms of sex, uh, and in terms of other forms of, of diversity, there is, there is an issue here. 
So uh, perhaps perhaps uh, one of my colleagues would like to uh, to chip in. No. Well, say there, is, uh, there is some action being taken within the R Foundation uh, with the R Forwards Initiative, and there's a, there's a big push now around building on ramps uh, into the community and and even I guess eventually into R Core. So that is going on. Yeah, I think one of the things we we talked a little bit about is is you know trying to think of how to put together a mentoring program so that people who might not, um, you know on their own initiative start providing patches have have a mechanism by which they can start to see what is involved and hopefully have mentors from our core available to try to to you know help people see what the sort of obligation is in doing this because it is a pretty onerous uh, task at times to make changes to the core and make sure they don't break any of the you know many many thousands of packages out there um, uh, you know, and so I think o over the next uh, year, we'll, we'll try to put together something that will we'll have you know, concrete steps that we can uh, uh, resource in order to, to help with that. Well, this may be add, we had, we had hoped as part of the use our in person to have maybe a half day workshop slightly in the spirit of the tidyverse workshop where we could go through some examples and, and, and just try and build some community, but then COVID-19 happened and that is one of the things that did go by the wayside. Hope, hopefully we can we can get back to that and, and use our 2021. I'm hopeful at least. Good, thank you. Oh, Martin, you, you wanted to add something? Yeah, there was a thought. I'm in a mass department and we have found out that um, more people enter. Now, this is about female male proportion and misrepresentation. Uh, many young people enter and, and women tend to fail, even though they enter with better grades than, than male. And, and we don't really know, but the current thinking is that Several of our processes are male friendly, and I'm not talking about ARC or I'm talking about ETH and, and in general, are male friendly and, and female unfriendly. And this, of course, is somewhat debated, but there was actually some agreement that uh, this was true, and they changed some of the processes with first year students and so on. So maybe if, if uh, women find things about our core and our core processes that they think are male friendly, female unfriendly, we would be happy to know about it because we are not women, so we cannot find these things. So maybe somebody has to point them out friendly to one of us or to all of us. That's just a remark. and I don't really know if it will help. Okay, thanks, Martin. Um, this next question is very open-ended, uh, but it was already uh, asked uh, earlier to Martin. Um, what are the biggest challenges or obstacles that our core faces and what can the community do to help? Actually, I, during the break, I, I, uh, some, one answer came to my mind about which we talked within our core even yesterday uh, and, and by email before. One thing they could help and we haven't told them is testing our pre-releases against much of their own code and usage. So we've seen with the 4.0.0 release that there were one or two blunderous uh, code changes that needed to, to be resolved by a 401 and 402 releases, and they could have easily been detected by people checking the, these R versions before they were released. So we are actually really looking for people who help systematically testing versions of R before they are released. We can only do so much and not all of it can be automated. Some of it is really about interactive usage of certain features of R and R packages. And we really are, would be helpful for 
considerably more people uh, to do this somewhat systematically. Yeah, I, th I think what our original model was we would put out pre um, uh, candidate releases and people would test those, but that, that's clearly not happening and as much as needs to be. And I'm sure it's because it's not easy enough for people to do that is too invasive, too complicated, too much risk of, especially on Windows and Mac, either risk actual or perceived risk that it will destroy your working setup. <laughs> you know, you're not going to go there, uh, which is perfectly understandable. Um, but I, at this point, I feel I don't I, I'm fairly confident there are people who would like to help, but for one reason or another are not, and I don't understand what those reasons are. So this is an area where it would really help if we could get some feedback, maybe through our Devel, um, uh, on on you know, you know, I would test if it wasn't for X. If we knew what X was, we could do something about it. But I don't know what X is. Um, and there may also another option. I think we've talked a little about is whether we can. I mean, there is a, always a bit, you know, okay, yeah, I know I should test, but somebody else is going to do it and everybody thinks the same thing, so it doesn't get done. It may be useful if we can have an arrangement where a few people agree, yeah, I'm going to test this for you. Um, this, this is something that would be most natural with some of the companies like our studio, for example, who make very heavy use of R. If we had a clear-cut understanding with them that, you know, when we announce a pre-release point, an alpha test, beta test point, they will put someone on it to do it. And if there's something we can do to help with that, uh, or there's some reason why that's not working out, um, like I, say, I think we don't understand what's, what the issue is, um, but it would really be nice if we could find more, <laughs> it'd be nice if we didn't make mistakes, but that's not gonna happen. It'd be nice if we could find more of them before the releases. <laughs> And I'd like to clarify just the point that this is not just about, you know, automated tests that can be done because those we usually try to make or try to go through, but it's really more about, you know, different use cases that people have that may not be part of um, you know, the CRAN packages or core R, which is what, what is being tested. But, you know, there's a lot of code out there and users out there that, um, you know, you use R in ways that is not part of the tests in, in, in packages. And that's sort of what we're, what we're looking for, I'd say. Yeah, it's also uh, a good way to help uh, for people who are not uh, very experienced programmers or not very technically skilled because they are very good. Such people are very good at finding bugs that uh, the programmers overlook, right? That there is uh, oftentimes after a release, I, I, I see some bug reports that scare me because it's something I have broken, right? And oftentimes it's encoding issues. People use unusual characters in their login names, in some directory names. They use spaces where we would never do it. And uh, yeah, these things uh, are usually found by people uh, who, who are not programmers. And this is where they can help a lot. Also, uh, even though now it may be hard to install multiple versions of R on some operating systems without uh, being safe like from from accidental damage uh if someone has more time of course there is virtual box there there is a number of uh, tools that allow to install r in a in a virtual computer it takes more time but but it could be done already and one can install everything there and safely experiment in a virtual machine okay thank you um, this is a question from uh, Fodil. He says, uh, our studio engineers develop amazing packages. Wouldn't it be also interesting to collaborate with them in order to improve our core? Um, so, well, let, let me unpack that question a, a little bit, uh, if you don't mind, Fodil, and just ask the panel, um, what, is, what is the relationship between uh, our core and our studio uh, engineers? Well, I, I can uh, say that that's such a good idea that it, it does actually happen. So, um, yes, we, we do talk to, to some of them and we do accept code from some of the, the, um, the R Studio guys and, and um, it makes R better. So, yeah, it does work. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. I mean, there, there's a number of folks at our studio that I talk with on a regular basis and, and get code patches from and their ideas to think about and we go back and forth. The, the, what I talked about in, my, in, in my, my talk, the global conditioning handlers was very much a, I can't even remember whether it was Leonel or I who first, I've been thinking about it for a long time. He brought it up. I think that was what it, and then we worked together to get something that made sense for what they wanted to do, made sense from my point of view. Uh, it actually, that actually worked quite well, and and certainly on the on the issue of whether or not we should add a pipe uh, along the lines that I, I again I talked about, we'll be going back and forth with them. Now we may not agree, and 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 they have different uh, goals at at some times than we do, but more often than not, I think they dovetail. We certainly uh, uh, do um, do collaborate. So there are, is collaboration. There could probably be more. Uh, but uh, well, we're certainly, I, I think of us as being on pretty friendly terms on the whole and uh, so. Yeah, and there, there's also a number of our core members on this, our consortium working group around uh, finding a common unified framework for object-oriented programming in R. Uh, and that's, that's also a fruitful area of, of potential collaboration. So there's, there's, a different, there's a number of angles we're taking. Well, and then there is some input from our studio employees, uh, the, uh, like of the kind that could come from anyone else as well. Like, like we had a lot of bug reports from uh, from our studio people, and anyone can do it. But of course, they can as well, and they have the resources to do it, and that's welcome as well. So there, there are in fact many channels of communication open between. Uh, our studio engineers and, and members of the, of the R core team, uh, which is a very good thing. I can, I can maybe add one other comment that um, in some respects, we have sort of different life cycle approaches in, and um, we tend to try, we do occasionally make breaking changes like strings as factors. We try and minimize that on the whole, and our studio, they're pushing some things and changing things and making not entirely backward compatible changes a little more frequently than we like to in our in, in the base. But that, that that's fine. So for, for a lot of what they want to do, that's what they need. But that's not what we would want to do in in base R itself. Um, so um, I, I, we have different goals at, at times, but there's definitely collaboration on on uh, on things where the goals overlap. Yeah, and they're not the only commercial entity that sort of works at, on R at any level. And so it's, you know, it's a, a little bit inappropriate to align all of our core with one company and, and leave others out. You know, what we're trying to do is really steer the, the sort of R development process to what, what we think, you know, sort of Michael alluded to, to it earlier of what's the best thing for people that are really trying to analyze data, whether it's data science or, or or uh, statisticians, biostatisticians, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question is actually one that uh, every single panelist could give a different answer to. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to deal with this one. Um, a question about the time you spend due to your involvement with our core how much is community management support and actual software development? What split did you expect before joining and what split would you prefer? Well, I, I, guess, I guess I should, I should uh, tackle that problem myself since it's a, a question myself since it's such an open-ended uh, question. The distinguishing feature of, of our core is that these are people who have access to um, the, the code base. Um, of R and have permission to, to change it. Uh, beyond that, um, there is a larger group of people who belong to uh, the R Foundation. R Foundation members can be involved in all sorts of other activities, um, such as um, community management and, and outreach and so on. Uh, but the, the important thing about R Core is that the, these are people that can make changes to the code. So, um, you know, in, in, in speaking for myself, uh, I would say that I would like to spend uh, more time doing software development, but uh, I actually um, 
have a job that requires me to do many other things as well. So speaking for myself, I'm, I, I don't have enough time to do any of the things that, uh, that you're asking about, Daniel. Um, does, any, does anybody else uh, want to pick up that question? Yeah, I can only second what Martin was saying, and it really depends. So, for example, for me, you know, since I'm maintaining the Mac binaries, it's it's really mostly about um, figuring out what uh, how to work with with uh, package authors to make things sure things work, how to build systems um, that are uh, automatically building everything, and and figuring out where errors occur and so on. So it's much less of of coding that I probably would have expected originally, but uh, it's it's very much needed and. Uh, um, of course, you know, if, if there is spare time, we can happily add more features or, or improve R, but it's not, not, not always what you end up, end up doing because there may be more important things for R um, out there. Yeah, I, uh, I can say that I try to spend as much time as possible with, with the code, but it might be surprising maybe for some people and it was surprising for me how, how little time can be actually spent on on writing new code. Like when I was a student, I could write thousand lines of code a day, and I thought it was about okay, right? So now I don't know what's my average, but maybe it can be five, right? I heard that uh, some people doing safety critical systems they write like two lines per day, right? Um, so most of the time is spent uh, by reading code, analyzing bug reports, debugging bugs that are. Uh, from my code or from packages, but you never know before you find the bug. Um, communicating with the package authors and and so on. Yeah, I think it might be important to stress that our core people basically do what they want to do and what they feel is necessary to do. I mean, there there is no real scheduling of time as the question might be read as implying. So people will fade in and out of our core work depending on life circumstances, job changes, and so forth. And in general, you're free to do whatever you feel is important and what you feel is necessary. And of course, there are situations where we find collectively that something is necessary and someone ought to do it. And then usually someone will pick up the ball and and run with it uh, and if no one does then maybe it wasn't all that important i think this might also be of some relevance for people who are considering approaching our core status at some point if they're good enough to work on the on the code base, they don't necessarily need to be eaten alive by joining uh, our core. The important thing is that they're qualified. The important thing is that they do serious work, uh, at least periodically. But we, we will try to be friendly to them and not uh, ask too much of them. Thanks, Peter. Yes, and another another point, maybe CRAN, for example, right, where we also do quite some work for checking packages, asking people to fix things, and so on. And at this point, I do not even know um, under which category I should summarize the things, right? Is it communities? community service is it support for package maintainers or is it also the development of infrastructure for CRAN? Um, um, I, I, I couldn't say how much we spend in which part of it I just know that we spend quite a lot of time on getting the things straight there Okay, thank you. I'll move on to the next question. Um, so, oh, they've changed. They've changed order. It's just threw me a little bit. So, uh, the next question on the list is: 
Um, is there any chance or are there any ideas about making ours C API thread safe, uh, possibly in the long run, not necessarily tomorrow? Uh, I, I, I'm guessing that's a question for, for Luke and for Thomas, if uh, either of you might want to chip in there. It's just something I've thought about a lot and Duncan Temple Lang has thought about it in the past. And my view is basically it's not realistic. Even if we could do it to core R, there's no way we could make sure that as soon as you go into package C code, it stays thread safe. So I, I think it's just the, the best we could do is what Python does and have a global lock so that whenever you're inside of any of our stuff, only one thread can be running. We could do that. Um, I'm not sure it's all that beneficial. Um, it's more beneficial in Python because Python is designed as a, as a general purpose programming language is designed for doing a lot of concurrent things. So being able to describe 10 Python threads, only one of which is actually doing anything. The other ones are waiting on something. That's a situation you'll run into in Python. That's for us, the only reason to go multi-thread would be actual running in parallel. And there, the global lock wouldn't help. And if you actually want to get parallel running, you're much better off using the process level parallelism that we now have via parallel package, for example, or if you like the future wrapper around that, something like that. Um, I, short answer is no, for me. Yeah, I have I have the same skeptical view. Similar, I I think that uh, the code uh, of the core of R is already very complicated. It's hard uh, to maintain it, and uh, you see how hard it is to get uh, people to to contribute code because uh, in, there is not so many low level programming experts in the statistical community. Of course, it's not the job, right? And uh, so. So by introducing uh, native threads into, into the code base, I think it will just become unmaintainable. And then uh, there is the packages, right? And once it would start in the packages that are so hard to debug now, it, it will, I think it will be the end, right? R is uh, very open to, to packages, allowing them to do a lot in the native code. Me as a computer scientist, I would let uh, the packages do much less than they are doing. Uh, but it's already done this way. And uh, I think that since it is done this way, we just can't have native threading in R. And at the same time, uh, maybe it's really not, not so much needed uh, when uh, computations can be parallelized externally. Uh, what maybe could be improved uh, or added would be some coordination or tools to coordinate between packages, how many threads they, they start, worker threads they start so that they don't overload the machine. Um, that is something that could be done, but it's much easier than native parallelism in the language. Thank you. I don't see anybody else uh, raising their hand to talk, so I'll move on to the next question. But that, that was a pretty comprehensive answer, Mark. Uh, the answer is no, so. Uh, Henrik Benson asks, uh, is there a skill or expertise that our core currently lacks and that a new person joining could bring in? Well, I must say that there's, there's a philosophical question here because Donald Rumsfeld famously classified uh, unknowns into different classes, including unknown unknowns. There may well be unknown unknowns, uh, things that we don't know that we need, but that we do need. Uh, but we can only answer questions about things that we know that we need. And, um, I, I think Thomas already alluded to the fact that there, are, there aren't many people who are really experts at, at, at low level programming. I think most people who are our users and our developers uh, are uh, statisticians or data scientists and uh, don't necessarily have a, a hardcore computer science background. It's extremely good for our community, but I, I guess it's it's an issue when it when it comes down to um, some very low level programming issues. 
it's also that uh, maybe we we cover uh, the expertise that is needed, but of course we could use more people with that expertise, right? That's the other thing. <laughs> yeah, I think we need you know people with enthusiasm. That's a a skill. I, th I think we we have it, but we could definitely use an awful lot more of it, um, and and maybe some youth. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> we do have around in the surroundings of the mailing lists and so forth, we and package space, we, we do have some domain experts, uh, some of which might be worth uh, including. I'm thinking of people like Carleen Sotart and all this um, differential equation stuff that she's been working on, some people in the mixed models area and things like that. We might want to have upgraded the breadth of statistical expertise inside our core that that's not something we've been discussing much mutually, but it's, it's, it's an idea that I just thought I'd throw on the table. Okay, thank you guys. Um, Magnus asks, um, R has developed organically and I'm sure has many foibles as a result. If you could start over, what would you change? That, that's, uh, that's kind of a difficult question to answer because uh, R developed in, in a certain historical context. Um, and I'm not sure if the question is, you know, if you if you could rewind to the mid 1990s, what would you do? Or if you were starting uh, R today, what what would you do? Because in the latter case, of course, the computing environment is is very different now. Um, but also, I would say the, the the strength of R comes very much from its organic uh, development, the way that it, it it's built on layers and layers uh, of of uh, statistical computing uh, history. Uh, I think that's actually that's actually a good thing. Um, I don't know it's it's a uh, does, does anybody else uh, want to chip in here? Well we inherited a lot of stuff also. I mean we're built on S and we had a lot of design decisions were already made when R was on the table and we had a long phase in the late 90s where we were basically cloning S class version 3, colloquially known as the prototype. Um, and of course there are aspects of the original S system that we might have been better off if we had thrown away at the point at that time, but, but we felt it was so important that people could reuse their S plus code that we didn't do it. Um, so, I mean, we've got various little things like the sys.parent uh, mess, which we're trying to keep in sync, in sync with how it used to work with, within S plus and it sort of doesn't quite fit with the model that, that R is actually working with. Um, maybe we just shouldn't have that kind of thing. And there are various other things where decisions have been made just basically on, on how, it, how it used to be and maybe not in, in terms of what would be the ideal thing to have. Several things in the data frame area was also just swallowed whole. Yeah, I think if, if, you know, just retrospectively after all those years, I mean, one thing it would be to be, uh, to have more consistency, which, you know, as things grew organically, that's probably the biggest thing. It's just being historically how things evolved, uh, which is what shaped the, you know, whether it's the names, whether it's the, um, design structure or, or arguments of, of certain certain functions. So, you know, sometimes it would be better if, if that could have been done less organically, but there's just you know no way to, to fix that without replacing things. 
Yeah, there's a fair bit of complexity in particular in the object-oriented programming here with S3 and S4 and all the other uh, R's and S's that are built on top of that. And I think we could, there is an opportunity, I think, to try to address some of that complexity and try to simplify, give give users a clear way forward when they want to develop uh, object-oriented code, you know, how, how to go about that in a, in a systematic way. Okay, I don't see anyone else uh, wanting to, to chip in, so I'll, I'll move on. Terry Turno writes, uh, what plans for heavily used packages when the authors retire, uh, such as uh, mass and survival? Um, well, Terry is, of course, the author and maintainer of the survival package, and the author of the mass package is, is not with us at the moment. So, um, uh, let, let's let's open this up into a general sort of succession question. Uh, it's not just a, a, an issue of a heavily used package. It, it is a question of, of demographics as well. Do we have any succession plans? It's certainly an issue that we've 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 discussed. Uh, I mean, it's I it's really. That. I think it's part. It's really part and parcel of the diversity issue as well. We, we're aware of the issue. Some of us probably more than others, but we don't. No, we don't have a plan, and we don't at this point yet know how to get there. We'd like to get there, um, and we know we need to, but it's certainly something we need to be thinking about. And I think for things, you know, a, a variety of packages with the, you know they're widely used and the maintainer is going to retire or step away from them, then, you know, hopefully somebody in the community that's a user and reasonably skilled will step in to, to take them on. But there's no, you know, it, it, it's hard for us to figure out how to have succession plans within our core and to, you know, try to make sure we're recruiting enough people on a regular basis to, to keep the, the numbers up to, be able to deal with the work, um, you know, in package land, we don't own the code or have any sort of rights over it, right? All, the, all of the authors have their own, most of them are pretty open to having somebody take over if they don't want to, but it's really going to probably be more a relationship with between the original author and, and one or more people that are going to take it on. If I, if I know correctly, the process can also be that the R core will take uh, maintenance of packages that are very important, but of course uh, there is a scalability issue, right? There is, and I, you know, there's also the issue of if you take on a package where you know you're not really using it all the time, and you're not a sort of in some sense a domain expert. We go back to what we were talking about earlier, right? The reason why a lot of packages are good is not because necessarily the software in them is great you know if, if it can get there with some years of improvement but typically it's because the person that wrote it knows what they want to do with it and knows what somebody in the field who's using that code actually does so it's not always as trivial as oh let's put it into our core you you know we could definitely keep the code going and understand how that works but you you really you know the advantage has to be around people using this thing and knowing what the where the field's going as opposed to it becoming sort of a static uh, thing they can see that a lot of package maintainers are doing it because when i find bugs or issues in packages and i i send it to to the maintainers and they don't know me they say oh you are a user of my package it's great would you like to maintain it and say, i'm sorry <laughs> i'm just debugging <laughs> Yeah, I think there have been successful stories too of packages uh, having uh, been retired and um, maintainers retiring and finding a good succession. Uh, and it, it happens as Robert says, typically by people who use it a lot and who know what new development has to look like, uh, things like that. In, in the spatial statistics field and um, there is, a, I think it's very good community. People are getting into retirement. Roger, one of the, our foundation men, members, and there are young people coming up and they have even changed their basic 
package from SP to SF and, and things like that. It, it needs the community that drives the packages uh, by experts. And that, that's, well, that's actually our success story that we really have experts in the field doing it and not just software engineers. Not, not to say that they are not very good, but packages are useful for users if they're written by users and right? statistics for statisticians, and as we said initially. There's uh, one point where we may want to distinguish between packages and recommended packages. So, so far we mainly discussed packages and um, what happens if a maintainer retires or some sort of that. Of course, for recommended packages as those, the original questioner had uh, mentioned, namely mass and survival, the uh, core team guarantees that the package is further on available for the, for the community. But of course, the core team cannot guarantee that there is some, some further development for the package will be done. Um, the guarantee is only that um, the current functionality will be available uh, further on. Yes, and that is already quite a promise that we sometimes are even a bit unhappy about, right? For instance, the NLME package is one important example. It's still used very much in parts of industry and places, even though there are newer packages that do similar things. And uh, well, anyway, it's already a low. All right, I shall move on to the next question, which is uh, from uh, Henrik Benson. Um, I know the answer to this question, says Henrik, uh, but this could be an opportunity to clarify the difference between our core, CRAN, our foundation and our consortium. So that's a fun question. Thank you for that, Henrik. Um, I think I'll answer this question. So I, I've already described our core. The defining feature of our core is that these are people who have access to and write permission to uh, the base R code. And Brian Ripley once described our core as a self-perpetuating oligarchy, which I think is a, is a nice description. Uh, so this is a group of people who have their own interests and uh, pursue them. As uh, Peter alluded to earlier, there's no uh, particular hierarchy um, within the R-Core, but there, there is a group of people who are pursuing their own interests. Among these uh, uh, is, of course, the CRAN team, uh, who have dedicated a lot of time and energy and effort to uh, building and, and maintaining CRAN. So that the R project as a whole can consist of groups of people who are not in a hierarchical relationship uh, are pursuing their own interests, but working together. So um, the R Foundation was created basically for two reasons. Firstly, to give acknowledgement to people who were making contributions to the R project, but not necessarily. Uh, in, in the form of code. Um, so this was created in order to acknowledge uh, these people. And the second reason it was created was to have a, a legal entity uh, representing the R project, because for some purposes, you actually need a legally well-defined entity that can accept donations and disperse money and so on. Um, the R Foundation uh, is part of the R Consortium. I've got to be honest with you, uh, even I get confused and say the wrong thing sometimes. So it, it is a bit of a shame that R Foundation and R Consortium are just so close together that, that it trips everybody up. The R Consortium is, uh, the members of the R Consortium are commercial organizations who have an interest in supporting uh, the R community and the development of R. And uh, these commercial organizations, they contribute money and the money is, is, is uh, disbursed by, by the R Consortium on various projects. Everything is open. Uh, you can see uh, on their website what projects they're giving money to and what those projects hope to achieve on behalf of the, of the R community. 
So um, if anybody feels that they, they want to uh, either expand on that answer or, or, or clarify some of the details, you're, you're most welcome. No, it seems like everybody's happy with that one. Uh, so uh, the next question is an anonymous question. Uh, only a few R core members seem to participate in R's Bugzilla and the R develop mailing list. Can R core keep up with bug reports and submitted patches? Should the team be expanded, maybe with specific roles? Well, this is kind of a question that came up during uh, Martin's keynote speech. Um, so. Um, can I bounce this question over to you, Martin? Yeah, but I don't want to be the only one. Um, yes, we have been talking about this within our core, uh, how we can get more people involved in Boxilla. And in my talk, uh, actually, as I said, uh, inheriting from Thomas Calibera's talk at EROM a month earlier, um, we had an effort last year uh, in, in fall, there was uh, Luke Tierney and Tomasz Calibera wrote an R blog about and, and publicized it on the mailing lists and even on Twitter that we would like to have people help with Boxilla and giving some ideas on how you can do that. We've created, uh, and well, there's one thing Boxilla is not self subscribing. And so even longer before we had created an email address specifically for people who want to help uh, with Boxilla. This is monitored by Deep Payan and me. Um, and people should show that they are not uh, spammers to the, to the Boxilla site because we had to close it because of spam and, and nonsense. So, so and together with this blog post, uh, as I've sh sh even mentioned the slide on the blog, we, we had a large increase in people getting involved with Boxilla, people outside of our core, because that was the main issue. We wanted not to have our core, but people can really help. And this is, by the way, this is very similar to what some see in, in GitLab and Hub and, and so on, that onlookers can help because they can also review bug reports, they can find better examples and so on. Uh, we have th been thinking of allowing, just yesterday we, within our core, we have been talking about uh, ideas to give them a little bit more power with the Boxilla, for instance, even to close bug reports or something like that. Yes, so the plans are that this is growing mostly by people from outside our core. I don't think we want to make life miserable for one of the R core members by <laughs> saying you must do this. We don't ever do that unless you must fix the box that you created. Yeah, that's well, that's that's the current state. I think we have been making big in big inverts. Uh, we should do some more data analysis on, on the Boxilla. I'm pretty sure we could say that the percentage of undealt bug reports has decreased dramatically, and even the number of bug reports per time ha has increased. And it's not it's not by by bug reports that are irrelevant or wrong. It's really by useful things. So that's I think one thing we can be proud of because we really made progress uh, in a good direction. But we can improve even that. Thanks, Martin. So the next question, um, what can Crown or R Core do so that new R users are not afraid to submit their first package? So Uva, why are you so scary? Oh, I don't know, but sometimes I feel it's a good idea to make people scary so we don't get this many submissions. <laughs> um, well, more honestly, I, I, I have no idea. I, I, I mean, if people 
um, develop their packages carefully and check their packages and follow the CRM policies, they shouldn't be scary to submit their, their code. If it is a new code that helps other people to, that helps our people to push things forward, uh, of course, a package is welcome. But it has to be checked carefully along the policies and everybody will be happy with that. We and the new users. Okay, thanks, Uva. <laughs> uh, Gabe Becker asks, what is the concept of recommended packages? Does it still make sense to have this distinction beyond part of R and external extension packages? If so, will we see new recommended packages? If not, will those that exist remain indefinitely? Well, actually, this is, this is something that we've talked about. I think I can answer the question historically. Um, as um, I, I think Peter referred to earlier, in the, in the early days of R, the um, S version 3 was considered to be the prototype. And in, in order to offer uh, exactly the same functionality as the prototype, it was necessary to augment base R with um, third party packages and these became the recommended packages so that the, the distribution uh, of R offered the same functionality as S plus three. Uh, the question of whether it, it still makes sense to have uh, recommended packages uh, is, is one that we've actually been uh, discussing. Um, I don't think we'll see new recommended packages, actually. Uh, I, I think it's, 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 it's more likely uh, that we'll see fewer than, than, than more, but perhaps somebody else would be interested to, to chip in here. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. It's very unlikely we'll see some, any new ones. Um, we might see one or two dropped. Um, it, it's, Thinking about our situation with it, with, with the teaching systems I use, that there's things that get installed typically by sysadmins who don't know anything about the statistics and the additional packages you might need. It's much easier, certainly, if you get them to install one thing, then say, do that, and then install some other stuff. Um, one of the things that's changed with the way Fedora is doing things, as near as I can tell, when, when you install Fedora's yeah, at least whatever R unit you get, I don't remember where that comes from, but the, the Fedora chunk that gets installed for all practical purposes has not just the recommended packages of, of that, that we have identified, but it has a tidyverse in it as well. So that gets installed in a very base level. And then I, as the person who installs the packages that my department needs adds to that. Um, you know, we used to have the issues you wanted the people to be able to get everything on a floppy disk, if anybody remembers what those are, or a single download. To some degree, it would make more sense now to say, get R and then pull in what you want. But because we have people working in these environments where, you know, things get installed for them and, and it's, it's harder than on top of that to get the right permissions to, for example, as an instructor, be able to add packages that all students can see, but not everybody outside because they might want something different that conflicts. That There's no good answers to that. I, I think there'll need to be some levels of hierarchies, but it's probably going to be different. Yeah, the, I, the recommended package may not make sense, idea may not make sense, but base and CRAN also doesn't quite work, is what I'm trying to say. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, yeah, I think one of the reasons, or I guess two reasons why we might stray away from recommended packages is one, uh, continuity and, and you know, maintainability, you know, our core having the resources to actually uh, you know, maintain the distribution, uh, as it were, ensuring that it continues to work, even though those, those recommended packages are maintained by, by individuals. Uh, and also, I think um, when we elevate one of these packages to uh, recommended status, we may discourage further innovation in the package space. I think we want to ensure that, that continues to occur. For two reasons.
Can I ask a procedural question? Um, because we've reached uh, the top of the hour now, and I'm not really sure how long the session is supposed to last, or if it should continue uh, until all the questions are done, or or, or if, uh, if we're actually stopping the, the process at, uh, after an hour. You are, of course, free to decide, but um, we were planning to stop the process after an hour. I can hand over uh, the remaining questions to you, and uh, you can maybe answer them through another medium as well. Thanks, Heidi. Um, I think I think we will stop here. And um, thank you, everybody, for your questions. Uh, I hope this has been uh, useful um, to see, just to see members of the Arcol in public all together. Uh, unfortunately, we're not on a stage, but fortunately, we probably have a slightly wider participation online. We've got people from New Zealand. Uh, West Coast, USA, Central Europe. So, you know, we, we're able to join you today from all over. So that, that, is, uh, that is an advantage uh, of doing things online. And, um, you know, we hope to have more our, our core activities in, in future, um, use our conferences as well. And uh, hopefully when normal service is resumed, uh, we can do this in person as well. Uh, and it would be great to meet all the people who are asking the questions as well, because that's it's a little bit disappointing not to be able to see people who, who are asking questions. But thank you. Thank you. Anyway, thank all of you. And, and thanks to, to the panel as well, of course. Thanks, Martin. Thank you for your moderation. Great job. Thank you. Bye, folks. Bye bye. I'm stopping bye. the stream now.